takes time, but it's well worth it because the more that research is real and, and exact, the, the more real the characters become. Hello, and welcome to History Through Fiction, the podcast. I'm your host, Colin Mustful, and today I am excited to be joined by F.M. Dimyad, author of the debut novel, The Sky Worshippers. Because when you're doing historical fiction, you have your own narrative, and then you have the plot that's already written by history, and you want to kind of weave the two together. F.M. Deem Yad was born in Kermanshah, Iran, and grew up in Tehran, where she attended bilingual schools run by Christian and Jewish minorities. This early exposure to different cultures and religions is reflected in her works and has enriched her writing. Deem Yad has a B.A. in biophysics from the University of Houston and an M.A. in writing from John Hopkins University. Her debut novel, The Sky Worshippers, is a fact-based historical novel that tells the story of three princesses from China, Persia, and Poland who transform the Mongols from within after they are taken prisoners by Genghis Khan and his heirs. Dimyad currently resides with her husband in Maryland. I'd like to start with the Mongolian Empire, which was an extremely vast empire and had a tremendous impact on world history, uh, but I think it can be overlooked sometimes. Can you give listeners a brief summary of the history that's covered in your novel and also talk about how you became interested in that history? Uh, Well, countries uh, that were um, impacted by uh, Mongol invasions, and that's a large portion of the world, including Russia, China, uh, Eastern Europe, and Middle Eastern countries. Uh, For them, uh, Genghis Khan is part of their history and a very well-known character. My interest, however, initially, I wanted to uh, portray uh, the role of women in in history, particularly those who were least, um, history paid the least attention to them. Uh, And since the Mongol period was a really dark period for women, I, uh, it attracted my attention. um, And then I realized that historians are baffled by the fact that Mongols from the time of Genghis Khan to the time of his grandsons, a period of 50 years, almost half a century that they ruled the earth. Uh, the, they went through a transformation from being virtual barbarians to being um, uh, very sophisticated leaders of these countries. And they wondered where and how that trans- tra- transformation took place. My uh, theory was it was women who were kidnapped, and many of them were, and brought to the Mongol court, or they were taken as prisoners of war, who played that role and uh, reared the children of the Mongols. Uh, Then I learned that there were actual princesses who were taken by the Mongols, and I knew I had a story to tell. We'll talk a little more about those princesses. They, they're the central figures in your novel. Uh, talk about why you, more about why you chose them and how you use them to convey this history. Um, 
the first princess that caught my attention was Chaka. She was actually married to Genghis Khan. Uh, it was arranged by her father, uh, who was hoping to not only uh, protect this country, which is the Tangut region of China, uh, Tangut kingdom in China, in Jijia region of China, uh, from attacks by the Mongols. At the same time, he was hoping to side with the Mongols against the other uh, dynasties, Jin dynasty and the Song dynasty, uh, that were uh, periodically attacking the Tangut kingdom. Uh, Chaka was sort of, sort of forced into the marriage. Uh, then uh, I, well, there was like two lines about her on Wikipedia, and I had to do uh, further research, not just about her, but also uh, the Chinese culture, prevalent culture and religion and beliefs and uh, all the details of 13th century life in China. Uh, then I learned, I found a depiction of a Seljuk princess. This is a dynasty that ruled Persia prior to the ascendance of Khwarazm Shah uh, in that country uh, who became a foe of the Mongols and they, were, they had wars with the Mongols. And I thought it would be an interesting twist because the a princess is always a princess, and they call her Shazda Khanum, even though they were no longer ruling Persia. And I thought maybe um, Genghis would make a mistake and kidnap the Saljuk princess instead of the daughter of Harasm Shah, his foe. And that's how the personality of uh, Rehan took shape. Uh, there were also uh, two Marys, both of them called Mary, two princesses from Europe that were taken. And Europe immediately disowned them. And uh, I, uh, and, uh, and the fact that they were both called Mary and they were both disowned and called illegitimate, I was wondering what really happened. And I checked and all the um, uh, princesses and royalty members uh, were accounted for in Europe. And then I learned that Henry II of Poland, ruler of Poland, uh, had a brother who had died. And I was wondering, maybe he took the children of that brother as his wards. And what if they were personalities like Christine and Sophia? And they would be kidnapped by the Mongols. And uh, that uh, sort of took me into the world of Europe uh, in the 13th century. Uh, and uh, these personalities, I wanted them to be very distinct from one another. And uh, it took a lot of research, a lot of hard work to get there. Well, I think you accomplished it. And, you know, I know, as you said, you did a, a lot mm -hmm. of research. Uh, but was it, was it fun for you to use that research to imagine the lives of these princesses? And also, was it difficult to turn it into a, a, a fictional narrative? It was extremely difficult at the beginning. I remember I studied at Johns Hopkins for a writing program. And I remember I told my professors that I have, I feel like I've swam in the middle of the ocean. I can't go back. I can't go forward because I had invested so much time and energy and the accounts, the historical accounts at the time were so confusing and so contradictory. Uh, several historians of the time were hired by the Mongols, some Persians and some Armenians and some Chinese, and uh, uh, their accounts differed. And they were scared of their masters, so they would not divulge all sorts of information. And recent history also contradicted with um, all, also the works of archaeologists. I learned that uh, despite the fact that the well-known uh, idea is that 40 million people got killed by the Mongols, that uh, recent excavations showed that the numbers were much less, and the Mongols were intentionally in exaggerating those numbers to create fear in the hearts of uh, lands that were not yet subjugated. So uh, it took more than five years of extensive research, and I do work systematically. I, If I leave the work one night, even, even when I'm having company or I have a headache, at least two paragraphs. And that systematic work helps me 
remain engaged with the characters because when you're doing historical historical fiction, you have your own narrative and then you have the plot that's already written by history and you want to kind of weave the two together and you have to remain in contact with the characters and with the scene and with, uh, with the setting that you are uh, trying to create. Uh, one of the difficulties I had was uh, today we live in a world that is so uh, interconnected uh, and uh, oh, we have pretty much uh, unified culture globally. Uh, back then in the 13th century, these regions were very distinct from one another, and there was very, very little communication between them. Uh, I had to research every aspect of life in each region separately. Um, I remember when I was doing uh, research on Anatolia, or pre uh, part of present-day Turkey, I initially wrote that there were roses there, and because Turkey right now is one of the probably largest producer of uh, rose water and rose petals in the world. But then I learned that in the 13th century, there were no roses in Turkey. To find out, uh, it was acunite, actually the flower that was common. To find that word, I you cannot just Google 13th century flowers in Anatolia and come mm -hmm. up with an answer. Sometimes you have to read a, a you know, a book or uh, read through a lot of uh, different material online before you reach that conclusion. So it, 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 took, it takes time, but it's well worth it because the more that research is real and, and exact, the, the more real the characters become. Well, it just sounds incredible the amount of research you had to do, especially as you explained it for different regions of the world that were distinct at that time. Did you do any travel to those uh, distinct regions for your research? I uh, did a, a lot of uh, uh, documentaries on Mongolia. I can almost envision my, uh, Mongolia. Uh, I have lived in uh, Iran, which is uh, the present name of Persia, uh, as a child. And uh, I also did a lot of uh, reading uh, for each region that I was reading. I mean, I love. Uh, Russian literature, uh, but I was reading uh, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Chekhov and uh, works of Sir Walter Scott when I was doing Europe and um, other works on, you know, like the Joy Luck, uh, Luck Club, although it's more recent, but it also reflects the culture of China. Because what happens is uh, these characters' reactions of each, each region would be different to the Mongol invasion. Uh, for example, Chaka contemplates suicide. And I thought Rehan would not do that. She was, she's not likely because she would see suicide as the end of life on this earth. But for Chaka, she, I added a line that she's daydreaming because she believes in reincarnation. Uh, she's daydreaming about returning to earth as a, as a dove or a doe and uh, being free in that way from the Mongol rule. Uh, so these are the little elements had to be incorporated to distinguish the characters and their voices from one another. Can you tell us a little bit about the title, The Sky Worshippers? Uh, how does that relate to the Mongols? Uh, actually, uh, shamanism was uh, the common religion in um, Central Asia in ancient times. And a branch of shamanism, and shamanism is the belief that natural um, phenomena have invisible forces in them that impact human life. And a branch of them in uh, practice in Siberia at the time, and also in Mongolia, although there were uh, Nestorian Christians in Mongolia as well, but uh, the common practice was uh, ten called Tangerism, uh, which is the belief in Tangeri, uh, the sky god, as being the uh, most powerful uh, you know, natural phenomenon. And uh, sort of you can, <laughs> you can uh, tell where this is coming from by looking at Mongolia, even parts of Mongolia present day. It's, it's a prairie that you know, stretches to the horizon and you have this vast sky above. Um, and then you have these uh, structures, uh, they call gurs, uh, tent-like or yurt-like uh, 
structures are made of cells uh, placed on um, a lattice framework, but they're far apart. So if there's a thunderstorm, maybe that's the reason they feared the thunderstorm. And there's you know, even, even incorporated in among all Yasa laws um, is because if it, there is a thunderstorm, you are so exposed and lightning strikes, it's like some, somebody's shooting you from the sky. So uh, uh, Genghis repeatedly refers to the eternal blue sky and swears by it. And um, he goes to Bohan Khaldun Mountain, which is a holy mountain in Mongolia, and prays uh, every time he wants to engage in war. Um, so you have uh, uh, this uh, belief system there that eventually changed, and many of the third generation Mongols either converted to Christianity or Islam or uh, they became Buddhist, a number of them became Buddhist. mentioned the, the some of the landscape and that reminded me throughout your novel you, it's it's very descriptive almost poetic at times uh, you do a wonderful job of describing uh, mm -hmm. the mountains and and the prairies and the deserts uh, can you talk about your creative writing in that way uh, does that come naturally to you and, and and just how were you able to create such beautiful flowing descriptions uh, I have to say that uh, language, uh, unfortunately, with the passage of time, especially in the 21st century, has been oversimplified. And uh, we have a tendency to want to get to the point very quickly. So we avoid uh, the complexity of language. Um, my uh, habit is mostly I read 19th century literature and earlier periods because um, of the richness of English language during those times. Uh, works of George Eliot, Thomas Hardy, even uh, re more recent ones of Daphne du Maurier, um, this breathtaking descriptions she gives or Margaret Atwood works, you know. Um, I, um, the continuous reading allows me to be able to play with these words more comfortably and also um, I wanted to mention something that when you're, when you're reading a history book versus when you're doing a historical fiction, uh, in a history book, you're seeing a lot of data and information. But when you're reading a historical fiction, you get an emotional dimension, which makes it more, uh, it gives you a deeper understanding of how really life was at the time and characters come to life. It's like you've experienced living in that era. And uh, that's what I love about uh, historical fiction. And uh, I'm hoping to continue and uh, especially uh, remain, uh, at least for a while, focused on the 13th century. Because it took me so long just, just adjusting to the, to the details of life uh, during that era, which was so different from us. Uh, even simple things like communication and uh, traveling from one corner of the world to the other, to all these rough terrains. Uh, I, in my mind, I was going from, uh, with the Mongols, you know, through Middle East, through uh, Russia, through Europe, now, all the way to the gates of Vienna. And they would have continued if, if, if Ogade had not died, which was the Khan or the Khan of Khans or the King of Kings at the time, uh, he died and they had a cruel time, which is a, uh, uh, it's a gathering of the elders, and they had to be present there to decide the next Khagan. And that's why the Mongols returned uh, to Mongolia. Otherwise, they would have taken over the entire Europe. Um, what, what is your ultimate impression, then, of the Mongol conquest of, of Europe and Asia during that time and, and its, its impact on the world? Uh, 
Genghis Khan uh, founded uh, Mongolia in 1206. And um, from 1212 until 1261, which is a period of almost half a century, he and his sons and his grandsons uh, ruled the largest contiguous piece of land ever ruled by a conqueror. So the Mongols can credit themselves for being the greatest conquerors the world had ever seen. Um, initially, there was a, a lot of carnage and chaos. And uh, of course, plundering of the resources of these nations. But by the time of Hulagos, Grandchildren, I mean, uh, Genghis Khan's grandchildren, like uh, Kublai Khan and Hulego Khan, we see that uh, the Mongols become administrators of the lands that they're ruling. And we are a very different type of uh, uh, rule uh, begins at that time. Uh, Kublai not only adopted the language, and uh, Kublai not only adopted the language and culture of China, he converted to be Buddhism, practically becoming Chinese. And the China, and he also was instrumental in united, uniting these three, uh, the Jin Dynasty, the Song Dynasty, and the Tango Kingdom, uh, who were warring before then, uh, uniting them in, in, uh, into a united China. And so the Chinese see him as the first emperor of a united China. Uh, Hulego, on the other hand, uh, was the uh, started the Ilkhanid dynasty in Iran, and he's also seen as one of the dynasties that ruled Persia. And uh, he, in uh, his seat of power in Marove, he uh, built the greatest observatory of the time uh, and invited scientists from all over the globe to participate and exchange views, which is uh, uh, amazing. And we see not only scientific exchanges that did not exist before then, we see um, uh, cultural exchanges and also more importantly, religious dialogue. Up to then, we had witnessed several uh, called crusade wars of both sides were fighting each other. And then suddenly uh, they were under one rule uh, <laughs> and um, Genghis imposed on them uh, the Yasa law, uh, um, laughing right now because Yasa law, uh, obviously he was getting some information from the Chinese and the Persians and other groups and Armenians. And uh, there are aspects of it that, uh, you know, is in line with other monotheistic religions, but there are other aspects that baffled uh, everyone, but they had to adhere to everyone under the rule of uh, Genghis Khan and his sons had to adhere to Yasa a lot. And it included provisions like you cannot wash your garments in a river during a thunderstorm and it's punishable. <laughs> so, but you know, uh, there was nothing they can do about it. But he realized, and this is a, you know, Genghis was 10 years old when his father was poisoned and rolled off the, uh, his father was the Yesuge of the Purijan clan. And he rolled off his horse and died right before his eyes. And he was supposed to lead the uh, Borjan clan after his father. And he was too young, so the clan uh, abandoned them, uh, abandoned him and his, uh, his mother and his siblings. And they took away everything, their livestock. And you imagine a 10-year-old in a, in a world where um, temperature, this is close to Siberia, temperatures reach minus, Fahrenheit, uh, minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit at times. And he has no shelter, no clothing, uh, and they have to catch birds and uh, fish and uh, eat those. And when that is not possible, resort to eating rodents. Uh, this is a child that would grow up in a world that uh, to kill or, you know, if you don't kill, you, you, you will be killed. He is still very young that he aims at his half brother who's abusive and kills him while his back is turned to him. And we would call that cowardice, but in the world that he's growing up, there's no other option. Uh, but then there's an aspect of him that, you know, 
you know, you were imagining this brute growing up in, in the wilderness. And there's an aspect of him that's very sophisticated. And I think he got it from his uh, mother. Uh, Elohim came from a, a hierarchy of Mongol society. And maybe through her teachings that he unites Mongolia, he, uh, they have the uh, first modern army in Mongolia uh, that uh, he, divide, he divides the army into units of 10 with each one having their own commander. Uh, these are actions of uh, a very sophisticated mind. Um, he also had the, uh, had the sense to realize early on that although he was a sky worshiper himself, and he didn't even understand the complexity of other religions like Islam and Christianity and Judaism, but or, or Buddhism, uh, but he understood that religion can be used as a tool. And at the same time, uh, a person who would not uh, fight for glory or food would fight to death for their faith. So uh, what he did, he started using religion as a tool. He spared all the clergy, would not kill them. He uh, exempted them from taxation and practically used them as his mouthpieces because people would listen to the clergy. Uh, in Karakoram, during the reign of Ogade, his uh, third son and heir, yeah, he, we see temples of Buddhists and uh, mosques and uh, 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 churches and synagogues next to each other and people freely practicing their religion. Another interesting aspect is we see women in the war crimes. Uh, Mongol women fought in wars and participated uh, uh, either in the war front or uh, behind the scenes. And uh, uh, we see them uh, ruling uh, regions in Mongolia, uh, Sir Hosani Beki, uh, the wife of one of Genghis' sons uh, had her own territories that she ruled. Uh, Torijin, the wife of Ode after her husband's death, became regent. And she was ruling almost like an emperor, empress, uh, uh, huge territories of the Mongols. So many historians uh, believe that Mongols sort of paved the way for the modern civilization to take shape. Wow. Well, it's an incredible history, unimaginable to think what life must have been like for young Genghis. Um, and there's just so much to, to un unfold from all that history. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. You said you grew up in Iran. Um, talk about uh, growing up there and how that has influenced your writing. My father came to Iran. Uh, he was born and raised in India when he was 29 years old. And his father was a linguist uh, teaching English literature. So the love of English literature was already in the family. And he exposed me to it at a very young age before even I started school. I would memorize these passages that I hardly understood. But uh, he gave me the love of English literature, which stayed with me all my life. Also, he sent me first two years of my schooling to a Christian school. And uh, all the way through ninth grade, I attended a primarily Jewish school. Uh, that gave me an understanding of minorities because they were you know, offering English classes there. Uh, it gave me an understanding of minorities uh, uh, living in the Middle East. And you see that reference often in my writing uh, because they are the most vulnerable during the times of war. Um, because they're smaller in smaller groups. And uh, so I am sort of grateful for, for that background. You said uh, that you um, are looking to do more fiction writing. Can you tell us what you're working on now? Are you still focusing on the Mongols or some other aspects of their conquests? Actually, while I was doing the uh, Mongol uh, research, I learned that Bela, the king of... Uh, Hungary uh, during the Mongol attack, uh, reached out to uh, Pope Gregory and also to Frederick II, uh, the uh, Holy Emperor of Rome. And they both gave some superficial support, but not really, because they're fighting each other. And then <laughs> initially I was going to incorporate it into the Mongol tale, but it was already 
you know, overwhelmed with information. So I decided not to. And then I learned that Sicily at the time was an independent country and was in the vicinity of Tunisia. And there was a lot of uh, trade and interaction going on. And uh, this is interesting. The, um, in Sicily, they were producing a lot of wheat and they used that wheat to make all sorts of pasta and uh, breads that are you know, to the taste of the Italians. And they would carry that same wheat on boats, uh, take it to Tunisia, and uh, they would uh, be making breads in a completely different way for the Tunisians according to their culture. So that interaction interested me and I am starting to work uh, on my second novel, again, focused on 13th century, this time Italy and the Holy uh, Roman Empire. With uh, the main characters being being female again or, or what kind of main characters? It is still in? too early to tell, but uh, definitely there will be female characters uh, that would play a role uh, in, in the tale. Uh, but not necessarily just focused on women. Uh, I, I want to bring a part of, I mean, there's a lot that's been written uh, about uh, British history, but not that much about Italian history. So I thought that would be a fresh idea to tackle. It, as I said, it's too early for me to get too much into it, but I found the whole idea fascinating. The, the idea of what was really going on in Italy at the time. Well, it's definitely something to look forward to. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I've been talking with F.M. Dean Yad, author of the debut novel, The Sky, Sky Worshippers. Thank you so much, uh, Fatima. Thank you. Appreciate it.